Good morning. Um, I trust you are all doing well. Um, this morning I decided to wear a tie because I was so um, impressed with Matt and how uh, he dressed up for sharing. And I was so encouraged with what he shared about the wise and foolish builder. So I thought he couldn't be on his own. So I decided to put a tie on this morning. We don't have many ties because um, you don't have many ties in the days we live. There's not many people wear it, so I hope it matches. And I just also want to say that it's not just my top that um, is neat. I've also got a good pair of trousers on, and I even put on uh, smart shoes, and they've been cleaned recently. Um, and so I'm looking neat all around. I don't know if everyone who shared can say that, because you can't see the bottom part. And um, I don't know if this is letting the cat out the bag, but um, every time my dad shared, he shared with his pantoffles on, his slippers. <laughs> so, um, and I think he actually wants to, when after this lockdown's done, he wants to come around to all the Bible studies wearing his pantoffles because he says it's comfortable. Um, but yeah, so I'm dressed up nicely and I'm encouraged and we don't have much time. So I'm going to jump straight into the word and I am so I was thinking this morning as I was spending some time in the Word that I'm so glad we have the Word for times um, like this because we can't have fellowship with each other, we can't see each other, but we can still be encouraged, um, uh, given direction by the Word of God. And um, this year I've started uh, trying to read from Genesis through Exodus and try and read a chapter a day, even if I'm reading somewhere else and um, I hasn't gone exactly to plan, but I'm in Exodus at the moment, and I've really enjoyed the story again of the Egyptians um, leaving, uh, oh, sorry, the Israelites leaving Egypt. And we were reminded by that um, on Friday, and we all know the story so well because the Israelites find, them in a, find themselves in a place in Egypt, and they are in bondage. And the, they cry out unto the Lord because they're busy being persecuted and they don't want to be delivered. And the Lord hears their cry and he raises a man called Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And um, I was just thinking a bit about being in bondage and the um, Israelites were really, they were slaves. And when you're a slave, um, you don't have any free will. You can't decide what you what you um, can do in the day. The Egyptian, uh, the Israelites couldn't wake up in the morning and say to the Egyptians, um, listen, yeah, I don't feel like working today, so maybe I'll take Monday off and we can um, start on Tuesday. The Egyptians wouldn't have allowed that because they were the slave masters. They would have said, listen, yeah, um, we can hit you around a bit maybe to change your mind, but you're starting on Monday because you're a slave and we're the slave masters and you do exactly what we say. And Egypt obviously speaks about sin and being in bondage. And guys, you know, in the same way that the Egyptians dictated the terms to the Israelites, sin, if we don't find Jesus, sin dictates to us. And it might not, you might sit there and think, I know exactly what's going on and I've got free will. But indirectly, sin dictates to us and it keeps us in bondage. And I was thinking, um, everyone you speak to who's found Jesus, they speak about an incredible uh, weight that's lifted off their shoulders when they finally meet Jesus. Because before they were in bondage to sin. And guys, you know, sin will dictate us right into hell one day if we're not careful. And if we don't find the Lord Jesus. And in the same way, the Israelites were in bondage to the Egyptians. We are in fact, because of Adam, born into sin and we're in bondage to the sin. And guys, we need to find Jesus so we can be um, set free. And um, I just wanted to uh, start off like that. And what happens is um, God raises a man. Um, his name is Moses. And Moses does 10 plagues, as we heard um, uh, on Friday. And the last plague is a the biggest plague. And after the nine plagues, the Pharaoh's mind changed the whole time. First, he would let the uh, Israelites go. And then he would harden his heart. And then he would let them go. And then he would harden his heart. Heart and um, what happened was God came in the 10th plague. He said to Moses, tell the people it's going to be the greatest plague um, of all the nine uh, compared to all the nine plagues that had already been. And um, what he, uh, the plague was, was that all the firstborns um, 
would die of the Egyptians and all the firstborns of families who never painted the blood of the lamb on the lintels of the um, doorposts. And um, what happens is Moses comes and he gives very strict instructions to the Israelites about how this plan is going to work, the tenth plague. They had to go into their homes, they had to um, um, find a lamb, and it had to be a lamb without spot and blemish, and there were many instructions that Moses gave. And one of the instructions they gave, and I just want to touch on this, it's in Exodus 12 verse 46 it says and Moses is speaking about this lamb that must be eaten and it says in one house shall it be eaten thou shalt not carry forth out the flesh abroad out of the house speaking about the lamb neither shall you break a bone thereof and um, I've read this story quite a few times but I've never um, seen this verse or the Lord has never brought this verse to my attention and I was so gripped by the attention to detail because Moses says to the Israelites listen yeah there's many rules you can read of the whole of Exodus chapter 12 but he says it's very important that you don't bake the bones in this little lamb's body you slaughter it you take the blood you mix it with hyssop you uh, paint it on the lintels of the blood post of your um, lintels of your doorposts so the angel of death doesn't come and kill the firstborn but it's important that you don't break the bones of the lamb's body and um, I was thinking the Israelites at that time they probably didn't think twice about it they just wanted to get out of bondage they wanted to get out of Egypt and so they said what Moses don't break the bones no problem we won't break the bones we just want to leave Egypt but you see it was part of God's massive plan of salvation and um, I'll remind you when the Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary for you and for I and it's really what we've remembered this weekend the greatest Passover ever was when the Lord Jesus was a perfect sacrifice and he was the perfect lamb um, when it what happens when you're crucified is that ultimately they break your legs eventually so you can suffocate and um, they broke the criminals on either side of Jesus's legs but when they came to Jesus he was already dead. And so all they did was pierce his side. And not a bone was broken in Jesus' body. And that little lamb, even as I said, even though the Israelites didn't understand what they were doing at the time, it was a picture of Jesus. And how Jesus would ultimately become the perfect sacrifice for you and I, like that lamb and the blood of that lamb saved the Israelites on the night of the first Passover. And the point I want to bring out um, this morning is that I was so struck by the attention to detail of God's plan of salvation. Um, it was a couple thousand years before when the Israelites left Egypt, before Jesus was crucified. And God said, Moses, tell them not a bone in that lamb's body. Because I've got a plan of salvation. And there's so much you could share there. But I was just struck by the God's detail and attention to detail and his plan of salvation. Ultimately, so he can reconcile you and I to him. And guys, I want to say this this morning. If God's plan had such attention to detail, I want to say let's buy into God's plan of salvation. Because he put this whole plan together why? So you could, as I said, have a, have a relationship with you and I, so you could ultimately save us and ultimately, so we don't have to spend eternity in hell. And he said, this whole plan is going to be so perfect, it doesn't actually really matter 2,000 years ago, but don't break the bones in the lamb's body because my plan of salvation is going to be perfect. They're every small detail going to be perfect, even if it really doesn't matter in the bigger picture. And guys, let's buy into God's plan of salvation. He was so serious for you and for me. And the next uh, point I just want to bring up before I move on, if God's plan of salvation really, as I said, was just to reconcile you and me, you and I to him. And it was so perfect. Can you imagine the plans he has for you and for my life? And guys, I want to say, let's buy wholeheartedly into this plan. And it's really a step of faith, isn't it? And I'm going to, I want to say this, and I say it with absolute confidence, the plan for you and I, your and my life that the Lord Jesus has, there's such attention to detail. And he's got it perfectly worked out. And he's standing, and I often say this in Pretoria, God, I think is so excited about the plan. And he just wants someone to buy in. He says, Jared, please just buy in. I love the plan. The plan's perfect. I'm going to use you. And it's going to be so, more, so much greater than you'll ever expect. Please just buy into the plan. I've taken care of every detail. And guys, I want to encourage us, as I just starting off like this, 
Let's first of all choose Jesus so we get taken out of the bondage of sin. Because it will dictate us, as I said, straight into hell. But then second of all, guys, God's plan of salvation is so incredible. We can't stand in front of him one day and say, God, it didn't, the plan didn't work. Because he said, I took care of everything. It was perfect. And the plan of salvation is so great. The plan for our lives is so great. Let's just simply take a step of faith. And let's say, Lord Jesus, I'm 100% in. And what happens is, um, I don't have much time here. Um, what happens is God delivers them incredibly um, out of the land of Egypt. And we heard a bit about it of, on Friday. They leave and you remember the uh, Egyptians all of a sudden realized, whoa, we've lost our uh, slaves over here. So the Pharaoh um, orders his army to rush after them. And there's darkness between the, e between the Israelites and the Egyptians. So the Egyptians can't find the Israelites. And I always wonder how that darkness was. Was it over their eyes? Was it a physical darkness? It must have been incredible to experience. Israelites must have looked back and just seen a wall of darkness. I'm not sure how it worked. And then... Um, God gave the angels some spanners and they took off the wheels on the chariots. And then God took them through the Red Sea on dry land. And then he closed the sea on the whole Egyptian army and he destroyed them one shot. And what happens is the Israelites are just moving into the um, wilderness on their way to the promised land. And um, they're so excited at the beginning because they write that Miriam writes a beautiful song about the horse and rider thrown into the sea. But so quickly they start murmuring and they start moaning. The first time they moaned was the bitter waters of Mara. And then remember Moses had to throw the stick in the water and it became so sweet. Then the very next chapter they start moaning and they say, oh Moses we're so hungry. We longing for the leeks and garlics in Egypt. Oh Moses, did you take us out here so they didn't have to dig graves for us in Egypt? And so quickly they forgot about the provision of the Lord Jesus. And guys, I'm so as I've shared this morning, I'm so incredibly fascinated by the attention to detail um, in all the stories in the Word of God. And guys, Moses forgot um, the children of Israel forgot the provision of the Lord Jesus so quickly and they started moaning. And I was saying about the tension of to detail. If you go read at the end of chapter 14, after they've um, gone through the Red Sea, it says that the Egyptian soldiers washed up on the seashore. And can and must have been an incredible sight. I'm sure some of the Israelites recognized some of the soldiers that washed up on the seashore that had persecuted them. I'm sure some of the Israelites still had the wounds in their backs from being beaten when those um, Egyptian soldiers washed up on the seashore. They probably said, oh, that guy, that guy hit me a few times. That guy murdered someone in my family. These are the ones that persecuted them. God's um, provision and God's saving, God's saving grace in that moment was so incredible, but they forgot it so quickly. And guys, it's the same, and, and we've heard this point shared so much times in our lives. But how did the Israelites forget the salvation of the Lord Jesus and what he saved them from so quickly? And guys, in our lives, I want to challenge us. We murmur so quickly. And we so quickly forget that moment when we found Jesus and that weight was lifted off our shoulders. And when we start murmuring, what do we start doing? We start finding problems with each other. Isn't that what the Israelites said? They said, oh Moses, you were so great, but now you've led us and we've got nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And they so quickly forgot about God's provision and the plan where God was leading them to, which is ultimately the promised land where he was going to build a nation of them. And God, so quickly we forget the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. We forget about the provision on the cross of Calvary, which we really remember this weekend, and what he paid for you and for us so we can be set free. And we start murmuring and we start finding problems. And I was so challenged. I was actually thinking it is actually a good exercise to sometimes just sit down and think of God's provision in our lives. Think about how he sets us free from our sins. He even, even though he doesn't have to, he looks after us materially. Make sure we don't go hungry. Make sure that we've all got a home to live in. Um, and he says that in his word. And as Christian, I think, shared a few days um uh, before, how even if he worries about the little um, Morsis, how much more does he worry about us? And guys, God's provision is great. Let's check our hearts. Have we started murmuring? 
We started, have we forgotten about the price that Jesus paid? I really believe with all my heart, we often have to be brought to tears when we remember what Jesus did for us. Because I don't know about you, but I look at my life and I often wonder, I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus in my life. Because I would have been a terrible sinner if it wasn't for Jesus. I'm not a perfect person and I haven't got things together. I've got things together because of Jesus. And are we murmuring in our lives? Are we finding a problems with God's plan? We so often do that, isn't it? We walk in this road and we say, God, we don't like how things are working out here. So we're taking it into our hands. Who cares about how much you provided us previously, provided for us previously in our life? We're murmuring and we're doing our own thing. And guys, I think we're living in a time of grace, but I think we really break God's heart. Because as I said before, God's sitting, he said, the plan's great. Just trust. Remember my provision. I've taken you through so much. And the Israelites, he's taken them through so much. He took the very slave masters and he brought them to nothing. They could have just, I'm sure the Israelites, some of them kicked them on the beach or and said, these were the guys that were persecuting us. They're lying here dead and they can't do anything. God's provision is um, incredible. And what happens is in verse 16, when they get so hungry, God provides manna for them from heaven. And um, I always thought that it came down from heaven. But as you read the word, it actually just appears in um, in the morning. And, um, you know, God's grace is so great. I was thinking, my nana always used to tell me a story of him, of her and my uncle Milton, and how they had an avar tree in the back of the garden. And um, my uncle, my nana couldn't get the avars down, and it was in Durban, so I'm sure the avars were very nice. And so she would ask my uncle to climb up the tree and um, pass the avars down. But um, uh, he often used to um, climb up the tree and throw them down very hard and try and hit my nana. And I often listen to that story and I never ever said anything, but I quite enjoyed it because I think it must be fun to throw avos at your mom. <laughs> but um, I was just thinking, you know, God's grace is so great. If I was him, I would have called the angels and said, listen, you angels, you throw down that manna. And if it hits the Israelites, make sure you've knocked all the nonsense out of them. Because I'm sick and tired of them forgetting my provision. But God so gracefully provides for them every time. From the bitter waters of Mara, he gives them quail so they have meat. Then he gives them manna from, um, from heaven. It was heavenly manna. And guys, I want to say we can so quickly murmur and we can so quickly forget about God's provision. But if we come back to Jesus, he so quickly provides again and changes the plan. And I don't want to say change is a plan because I wanted to say that because so often when we murmur, we go make our own problems. But Carl comes back and he says, I'm going to provide. I'm here. You're living in a time of grace. Let's work together. And so God provides this man. And there's a few um, uh, points I just want to bring out of here. We're in Exodus chapter 16. And it says over here, um, Moses is giving instructions. And after he gives instructions in verse 20, um, in verse 17, of Exodus chapter 16 it says and the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less and when they did meet with an omer he that gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack they gathered every man according to his eating and Moses said let no man leave of it till the morning Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses but some of them left of it until the morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was wroth with them. And so Moses gave instructions and the two instructions, well, the one instruction was, and I just want to start on that. He says, every day you need to go and gather manna that is going to appear like the dew. And you can only gather manna for that day. Because if you gather it for more than one day, except if it was the Sabbath, but that's a different story, then the manna is going to have worms and it's going to go off. And some of them actually did that because they got lazy and they forgot again of God's provision. They thought, let me just collect for the whole week. And it says there that Moses was wroth with them. But this manna speaks about the word of God. And I was thinking um, of that verse where um, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, teach us to pray. And he teaches them that our father. And in that thing, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And this principle was established because God says you have to collect manna every day. And if you collect for more than one day, it's going to go off. And I was also reminded of that verse where it says, um, 
we need to be ready in season and out of season to share God's word. And how are we ready in season and out of season? Because sometimes we're going through difficult times. Is if we've collected manna every day, then we'll be ready in season and out of season. And guys, the word speaks about the Bible. And guys, I want to say, and there's lots you could, there's many points, but to stop murmuring, guys, we need to spend time in God's word. We, it's not doctrine, but I would actually want to say we need to read it every day. We need to collect manna every day, fresh manna, so we can get our daily bread. So, And this word's incredible because, and there's so much you could share, it corrects us, it guides us, it warns us, it comforts us, it reminds us of God's provision, and we need the word daily. And guys, I wonder how many times we get so busy with life and our Bible gathers, gathers dust on the shelf. And if you have an iPhone, and I'm sure Android does it too, on every Sunday it gives you a a, a, a screen time it's called and it tells you how you've spent your time in the week and I was watching it I was looking at it the other day and you especially now in the lockdown you spend lots of time on social media and YouTube and you look and I read my I prefer a hardcover Bible but I only read the app on my Bible one percent and I wonder if God had to look at the screen time on our phones how often we've read the word Maybe it's 50% that, 20% that, and 0.5% God's word. Because we need the word daily. And it's and I want to encourage us, we need to spend time in the word. We need to um in, we need to make this word our own. We need to collect it daily. Every day we need to spend time in the word. Because that's what Moses instructed the Israelites to do. And um, I'm running out of time a bit here. But the second point that was so beautiful, Moses says that when guys collected too much, the manna shrunk. And when people collected too little, God um, grew it. So they were enough. In other words, there was no one bloated and there was no one starving. The manna was a perfect amount. And I love that thought because the word is always the perfect amount for the moment. I'm sure you've sat in, in meetings and you haven't even spoken to the person sharing. And they share out of the word and it speaks directly to your heart because it's a perfect amount. And it's a perfect thing that you need to hear at that moment. And the timing's moment, the timing's perfect and the content's perfect. And this word is alive and it's incredible. And I love that thought because no one could collect too much and no one could collect too little. And everyone was satisfied and full because this word is alive. And guys, this word is alive and it's got the right answers for you. It's got the right encouragement for you. And it's a perfect and it's going to be perfect every it's an F, sorry. So they have perfect timing every time and it's going to speak clearly. I was reminded of that verse, I think it's in Hebrews, where it says the word can separate the bone from the marrow. That's how incredibly accurate it is. I always say it's like a heavenly injection. Um, it always injects straight to the problem and it always injects straight to encourage you and it never, ever misses. And guys, I love that about the word. And I want to, as I said, I want to encourage us. We need to spend time in the word. Maybe we've been murmuring too much because we haven't been reading the word and haven't been, haven't been reminded of what God's provision and God's teachings in his word. And guys, we need to collect manna every day because uh, my dad always says many people have a memory, but all us humans have a forgettery. We so quickly forget what the Lord Jesus has done for you and for me. And guys, in ending, there's an incredible verse I want to leave with this encouragement. It speaks about this manna. And I don't know, when I read this verse, I really hope the Lord Jesus or God has kept some manna in heaven because I want to taste this stuff because it's incredible. In verse 31, it says, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Doesn't that bread ex uh, sound incredible? Um, I, I love bread when you've just taken it out the oven, um, when it's nice and hot. And I can imagine that manna was hot from the heavenly stove. And had coriander, and it was like wafers made with honey. Um, it must have been incredible. Bread makes you very fat. There must have been lots of Israelites rolling around there in the wilderness. But as I read this, it reminded me of the word that is so sweet and is so incredible. And as I said, it's so perfect and it has the perfect answers and we need to spend time in it. 
We need to eat of it daily. We need to get fat on the word of God. And um, I want to say this, and this is, I suppose, my own testimony. The more you spend time in the God's word, the more sweeter it gets. The more you, you can't wait to read it next. The more you can't wait, you find yourself spending hours in it just enjoying God's word. And it's like that manner that's coriander with honey infused in it. And it sounds crazy and supernatural, but that's how God's word is. It's crazy and it's supernatural. And so in ending, I just want to leave that with you guys, um, those few thoughts. And guys, I suppose the biggest thing to leave with is, guys, let's um, embrace the word of God. We've got time now um, with this lockdown and let's really spend time enjoying God's word. Amen. Um, let me quickly pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time Lord we could spend in God's word and we thank you for God's word which is really Jesus and Lord we thank you that you've given it to us Lord to direct us encourage teach us warn us Lord and I pray Lord that we'll each make it our own Lord and I also pray if there's anyone out there that may be still in bondage in Egypt Lord that they'll call out unto you and take a step of faith lord so you can set them free lord and we thank you for your goodness to us lord and we pray this in your name amen